We sing glory to God because Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem. And after Jesus Christ was born and lived a perfect life, he died, crucified outside the gates of Jerusalem. But you know, after Jesus Christ was born and after Jesus Christ died and they put him in the grave, Jesus Christ rose again from that garden tomb. And as the resurrected savior, then Jesus ascended back up into heaven. The same place from whence he came in the incarnation, he ascended back up into heaven. And you know, when he ascended back up into heaven, this was not to show us that ultimately his separation from us. When he ascended back into heaven, this was to show us that his ascension back up into heaven was the very first step of the consummation of his final plan when he would return and dwell with us forever and ever and ever. We've been singing this morning about how Jesus Christ came to the earth and he was born as a baby in a manger. This, his first coming, when he came to save humanity, this is what we celebrate. But this morning, as we celebrate the incarnation, this makes us anticipate the consummation. As we celebrate the first coming, this makes us anticipate the second coming because Jesus Christ, who came as a baby in a manger, he will come again. This is the hope of the church and this is what we're waiting for. And so our text today is from Revelation 21, the very last book in the Bible. Our text is from Revelation 21, verses 1 through 8. Revelation 21, verses 1 through 8. And as we read scripture, I invite the congregation to stand for the scripture reading. Revelation 21, verses 1 through 8. Revelation 21 says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers and the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. This is the word of God. May he write its truths on our hearts in this hour. You may be seated. How could we read the book of Revelation without trembling? And how could we read the book of Revelation without falling on our knees before our glorious King Jesus? This is the culmination of our Advent series, Fall on Our Knees, and here we're at the culmination of all things in the new heaven and the new earth. Jesus here is identified as the Alpha and the Omega. Jesus here is identified as God dwelling with us. It says there in verse six, he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega. In our 
stained glass here in the church. There's three, cro three crosses on that one. And on that one, there's an alpha and an omega. This means the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And here it says Jesus is the alpha and omega, the omega in the last book of the Bible, Revelation, but he's the alpha as Revelation 21, the omega uh, recapitulates just about everything that happened in the alpha, the book of Genesis. There's so much at the end of the Bible that draws from the beginning of the Bible. The literary tie-ins are absolutely exquisite. The connections between Christ's first coming in his incarnation at the beginning of the New Testament, God creating the world at the beginning of the Old Testament, and the consummation of all things in the last book of the New Testament. If you know the first three chapters of Genesis, if you're a little bit familiar with the story in the first three chapters of Genesis, let me just show you, it's so, it's, it's so simple. It's like, how did I not see that before? The story of the first three chapters of Genesis is right here in verses one, two, three, and four of Revelation 21. The first thing that happens in Genesis one is creation. And the first thing that happens in Revelation 21 verse 1 is there is created a new heaven and a new earth. You know, the very next thing that happened after the creation in Genesis 1 was the first marriage in Genesis 2. And here in Revelation 22 verse 2, we see Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice, it says in verse 3, saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. When God created the man and the woman in Genesis 1 and 2, creation and a marriage, and this was because God would dwell with man in the garden. And that's exactly what happened in Genesis 2. And here we find in Revelation 21 verse 3 that God is dwelling with man. But if you know the story in Genesis 1 and 2 and 3, Though God was dwelling with man, man and the woman chose not to dwell with, not to trust in, not to obey God. And in Genesis 3, because of sin, we have death. And here in Revelation 21 verse 4, we have the death of death. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Look at this hope-filled scripture with me and see how pretty much everything in here shows us why Christ came the first time and what it's going to be like when Christ returns to set all things right. Zero in with me on verse 3. These are the themes of the incarnation. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. The, the, the verbiage here is just piled on top of each other. God's going to dwell with us. We're going to be his. He's going to be ours. He's going to dwell with us as our God. And picture with me this wide sweep of the story of scripture from alpha to omega of God dwelling with us. In Genesis 1 and 2, we have God dwelling with the man and the woman. No sin, no death. God is dwelling with them in the garden. In that exquisite little phrase in the Hebrew that the, the Lord walked with the couple in the cool of the evening in the garden of Eden. Then we read from John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. This dwelling of God in three movements, the first is at Eden when he walked with us. The very next one is here in John chapter 1 where God dwells with us, Emmanuel. We've been singing with it in every song and everything that we've heard from the choir and all the scripture that we've read that the word became flesh and dwelt among us and so we've seen his glory. Glory is the, as of the only begotten of the Father. This is the miracle of the infinite infant king. 
Matthew says she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus and he will save his people from their sins and all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel. This is the mind-blowing miracle of the incarnation upon a manger filled with hay. In poverty, content he lay. With milk was fed the Lord of all, who feeds the ravens when they call. Jesus born, God dwelling with us. And so from Eden to the New Testament incarnation, and finally here in Revelation 21 verse 3, it says that when the new heavens and the new earth are made, a loud voice will proclaim from the throne, the dwelling place of God is with man. This is the second coming of Jesus from his incarnation as Emmanuel to his consummation as the returning king of kings. This, this is what we celebrate. This is what we anticipate. Jesus born in Bethlehem, crucified outside the gate, risen from the dead, ascended to heaven, will soon return. And this is the hope of the church. Here's the wonder of wonders that God will dwell with us and God will call us his own. What's the best thing? What's the best thing that you could have? What's the best thing that you could wish for? We all have wish lists at this time of the year. What's the best thing you could wish for? You know, the best thing you could wish for is that God would be with you and you would be with God. Perfect happiness is perfect holiness. Maybe you've never thought about that before. Perfect happiness is perfect holiness. God's holiness is our perfect happiness. Maybe you've never thought about it like this before. Sin is trying to get happiness running away from God's holiness. But in God's holiness is our perfect happiness. What's heaven? You know, you'd figure, as a guy who works at a church, I talk to people about God and heaven all the time, and I always ask people, what's eternal life? What's eternal life? The answer is always the same. Well, okay, I'll tell you what eternal life is. One, it's eternal, meaning it lasts forever. Two, it's life, meaning you don't die. And I give you credit for trying, but that's not the right answer. Eternal life isn't just that it goes on and on and on and that we don't die. Eternal life isn't uh, the, the gates, the, the pearly gates and the streets of gold, even though these things are described in these images in the book of Revelation. Eternal life is dwelling with God. And dwelling with God is eternal life. In other words, God, God doesn't promise to give you eternal life so that God can give you something else. This makes God like a game show host. Now, here's what you've won. Streets of gold and harps and baby angels and all this other stuff. That's not it. When God brings us to heaven, see what it says here. It's that we will dwell with God. There's not something else that he gives us. He gives us himself. In God's holiness is humanity's perfect, perfect happiness. This is eternal life. This is what we had in a limited way in Eden before there was sin and before there were tears. This is what we shall have verses 3 and 4 of Revelation 21 say when God wipes away all the tears. Look at how personal God's presence is. After he says three or four different ways, I'll dwell with you, you'll dwell with me, I'll be with you, I'll be your God. Look at how personal it is in verse 4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. You guys know the Bible uses like heavy language sometimes. Though It could have said, God shall cause all tears to cease. It could have stated it as a declarative, but it doesn't. 
puts fingerprints on it. It could have said, God will send a custom-made angel to perfectly eradicate all tears. But God doesn't send a messenger to do it. It says in verse 4, it's, it's almost too much to behold. It says in verse 4, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Can you imagine? It's so personal. We have, uh, we have one, we have one uh, grandchild, our grandson, and uh, he's not going to be here for Christmas. He was here for Thanksgiving. And when he was here for Thanksgiving, every time he ate, I, I wiped his mouth. And every time he cried, which wasn't often, because how could he cry when he's around me? But every time he cried, uh, with my hands, I helped to wipe his tears. Now, we're going to talk to him on Christmas, on FaceTime, but it's not going to be the same. <laughs> we're not going to be there with him. You see, he himself will wipe every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Look at what verse 5 says. He was seated on the throne, said, Behold, I am making all things new. This is what you just heard in both of those beautiful testimonies of the gospel. There's a, see, the gospel is personally, your life is made new by Jesus. Here, we have the cosmic consummation of the gospel where every individual woman and man whose life has been made new by Jesus is now placed in the new heavens and the new earth that God makes for everyone whose life has been made new by Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. That's the personal and the individual. Here in Revelation 21 and verse 5 is the corporate and even the cosmic of that very same reality. What wonderful news that is. And then verses 6 and 7. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have his heritage and I will be his God and he will be my son. Let me show you from verses six and seven, uh, four features of our salvation. First, the finality of it. The finality of it. It is done. The finality of it. Second, the fullness of it. Again, there in verse 6, I am the Alpha and the Omega. The finality of it, it's done. The fullness of it from Alpha to Omega, all of our sins wiped away. Next, and this is glorious good news, the freeness of it. Because it says to the thirsty, I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. It's free. It's free. It costs Jesus' life. It doesn't cost us money. And fourth, the family belonging of it. Because it says in verse 7, I will be his God and he will be my son. We belong to a family. We have a father who loves us and who will never let us go and who will wipe every tear away from our eye. This is glorious good news. This is great news and it's true and it's proclaimed here and now and it is offered to every person here. But verse 8 says, it doesn't belong to every person here. It's offered to every person here. But there is a, uh, what do you want to call it? A requirement, a restriction, a doorway. Because it says in verse 8, as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Don't misunderstand verse 8. Please, I am begging you, don't misunderstand what I'm about to say. When verse 8 lists those things, like liars will be excluded from heaven, it's not saying that if you've ever told a lie, you'll never go to heaven. When it says that murderers will be ex uh, excluded from heaven, it's not saying if you've ever murdered someone, there's no way you're going to go to heaven. Did you know that the Bible says the only people that will be in heaven are people who committed all of those sins? It's the only kind of people there is. So don't misunderstand it. 
See, it's, it said in verse six, didn't it, that he'll give us the spring of the water of life without payment. We don't have to like pay in good deeds to make up for our bad deeds. The issue is really in the first two descriptors in verse eight, but as for the cowardly, the faithless, the issue is faith. The issue is belief. Verse eight says the cowardly because an unbelieving world is just rushing headlong away from God. And every cowardly person joins the world in unbelief away from God. That's why being cowardly and being faithless are married together, almost as synonyms. The cowardly unbelieving who refuse to confess Christ. The cowardly unbelieving who say, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna listen to God's word, I'm only gonna listen to the world's noise. What this is saying is you can dwell with God. He can be your savior and he can make all things new. But you have to step out of cowardly unbelief. You have to step away from a world that's going in the wrong direction and hear and heed the voice of Jesus. You don't make up for your bad deeds with your good deeds. You don't pay for your salvation. This is what Jesus did on the cross. But being a believer means to believe in Jesus and to trust him. Will you come before him as Savior and Lord? Will you confess that you're a sinner? And will you simply say, I don't want to live in cowardly unbelief anymore. I don't want to live just telling myself what I want to hear. I want to have faith in what God's word has said. I want to have faith in Jesus as my Savior. Will you confess Jesus as Lord and Savior? And so, as a church, we rejoice because the one who came as the incarnate newborn baby in the manger will soon come again to make all things new. As a church, we rejoice because the Savior who was crucified between two thieves died so that thieves and the sexually immoral and the murderers could be washed and forgiven and he will soon return and wipe every tear from every eye of those who believe in him and even death will be no more. The one who at his birth had no room even in the inn but had to be born in a dusty, dingy barn, he will inherit the great throne in the new heavens and the new earth. Jesus alone is worthy for he died as man for the sins of man. And he reigns as God, giving eternal life, life with God to all of those who believe in him. Let's pray. Spirit of the living God, your word was opened. Your word was read. Your word was preached. Now, Spirit of God, bring it home into the hearts of all those who have heard. Only you can bring the seed into the fruition of new life. Bring your miracle of new life. Even in this moment, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.